Um, and this is where it gets um, a little bit more interesting. Um, and I think this is one of the areas where we're very much behind within, within education. So one of the frustrations is when we look at the world today, and it's partly medical profession's fault in terms of what's still in our textbooks, is that when we talk about intimacy, we always talk about sex. But actually, there are different ways to be bodily attracted to somebody and different ways of being bodily intimate. So I'm talking about bodily connection with somebody else. Um, and I'm using the word sensual pleasure versus sexual pleasure. And they are completely different because they're mediated by completely different hormones. Um, and it's not the default that everybody's intimacy preference is sexual pleasure. And I'm going to explain a little bit what I mean by that. So what's happened historically is that when we first started studying sex, all we did was sex. And the big study that got everybody excited was a study done by Masters and Johnson. Um, this is in the 1960s in America and Virginia. And they literally got couples to have sex in like a room with, a, um, I assume, a one-way mirror and various things attached to them and they sort of try to plot what they call the sexual response cycle any of you in the medical field would have seen this the cycle on the on the right here and what's interesting to note is that when they did the study they invited in you had to be heterosexual you had to be married you had to be cisgendered um, and the woman had to be able to have orgasm during vaginal sex which is I think less than five or ten percent of the female population so they basically selected out a very specific um, population within a very specific time period. And out of that, we've defined all intimacy gets measured against that. And probably one of the biggest um, fallacies that came out of this study is this idea of libido. So the idea was that you feel sexual desire when you are attracted to somebody and then there's arousal when you get under the covers, et cetera, et cetera. And so there was this idea that people are supposed to have a libido. They're supposed to have this spontaneous sexual attraction. Um, and so there was this whole thing about trying to figure out, well, what now is a normal libido? How much, how often are you supposed to have feelings of sexual attraction? And I'm going to talk a bit more about this um, in a minute. Um, and this is a challenge because these are some of the sexual myths that's been built up. And we even have had, we still got diagnoses in the psychiatric textbooks for people who don't experience um, sexual attraction. And actually that's probably, that is definitely also part of diversity. So to be able to understand physical attraction, you have to understand hormones. So we're gonna do a little bit of hormone stuff um, because endocrinological, endocrinology is what gives you the experience. And there's two main hormones involved in intimacy. It's quite a lot of other ones, but there's two ones that you can almost see as a kind of polarity. The one is testosterone, that's the one we know, and I'm going to go through that quite quickly. And the other one is oxytocin, which we sort of know of, but we, we tend to see it as like a precursor or an extra or a little something on the side, where actually these are two completely different ways of experiencing intimacy. In terms of diversity, some people are very strongly just testosterone mediated. Some people are very strongly only oxytocin mediated and there's a lot of mixture in between so a lot of sex for example will involve both of these hormones and it's helpful to understand where one sits within this spectrum so firstly let's just go through testosterone mediated so this is often visual um, stimuli that would create a an attraction to somebody, for example, not necessarily, but you see so they, it, it's very strongly linked to our visual system. Um, and the experience that one has physically is that of what we call sexual desire or lust. Um, and that usually have very particular physiological changes. So typically erections, for example, in a teenage boy. During arousal, what is experienced is actually an increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, increased muscular tension. And what is happening is testosterone is the hormone that the body is using to procreate. So it has a big focus towards, um, towards orgasm and towards the, the, the play zones. So the idea is that the erogenous zones get activated um, and there's a big push to get towards orgasm. And it's a very linear cycle, as you've seen on the previous page. And what's interesting with the hormones is they do have a bit of an emotional content as well. Um, and testosterone is very much linked to feelings of success, feelings of power, and potentially also to feelings of, of aggression, a little bit the dark side of testosterone. Great, so this one we know, this is what you see in the movies, this is what's in the medical textbooks. So what does oxytocin mediated attraction looks like? 
So quite often, this is much more to do with um, with bonding or uh, connecting with someone. And even if it's from a distance, it has to do with seeing somebody that you feel that you have a connection to. Um, and the typical experience of this arousal is the sensual attraction, and it's a physical experience. And we often call it an infatuation. We call it a crush. I'm a little bit nervous about the word romantic, because sometimes romantic just means um, an emotional attachment. And I'm talking here about the very strong physical changes that you feel when you are attracted to somebody in this way. So sensual arousal, so say you got together with another person who's essentially attracted back to you, and it might end up in a kiss or holding hands or chatting all night. Um, sensual arousal is got actually a decrease in blood pressure, a decrease in muscular tension, and there's a feeling of relaxation and expansion. Um, and where physical intimacy is very uh, erogenous zones for testosterone. As a matter of fact, the erogenous zones don't wake up at all because this has got nothing to do with orgasm. So what is much more important is touch and connection and bonding with somebody else. So the arousal is not linear at all. It tends to be expansive and build on each other and experience focus and very much in the, in the, in the minute. Um, and we know the oxytocin hormone is often called the love hormone and it's the hormone that has to do with connection and bonding and affection. So it's also the hormone when we excrete, when we breastfeed, for example, and it helps people to, to bond with their, with their babies. So this is just to give us a bit of an experience of the emotional content of these two hormones. And this, of course, is testosterone. We've had a few moments like that with the World Cup recently. Um, and this experience is this experience of successful, of getting the goal of, um, of power. So what does oxytocin look like? I hope there was an R ah moment there out there. Um, so oxytocin is what, what gets literally released when we see small vulnerable things or when we're in a situation when we're nurturing or bonding anybody else. So both these hormones have got very powerful physical experiences, but they're actually very, very different. So to make it even more interesting is that um, there's been um, some amazing actually woman scientists who's been taking apart that Kaplan, um, Virginia, the Masters in Kaplan um, cycle, and is starting to look at trying to understand desire in a different way. And I think Emily Nagas Nagaski is really revolutionized with this term that she brought in talking about responsive desire versus spontaneous desire. And I'm just going to explain what I mean by these two things. So both of these have got to do with testosterone-based desire, so sexual desire for, for an intimate partner. But with spontaneous desire, I mean, this is somebody who has spontaneous sexual desire, probably regularly in a week, with minimal or no triggers. So it takes very little for the desire to come, maybe like a lovely picture in a, in a magazine or somebody walking past um, or even very little triggers. And if you want to think in terms of spontaneous desire, a good example is your teenage boy um, who's still very much about 95% of teenage boys very strongly experience a spontaneous desire. So they also have spontaneous sexual fantasies, so fantasies that comes up um, even unasked for. And there's a drawn with, if you have a spontaneous desire, you'll be very much drawn more to um, pornography or sexually explicit material. Um, and you, find, you know, enjoy that kind, of, that kind of media. And of course, a spontaneous desire, one would expect to see masturbation and that to be quite common. What we now understand is that there's also people who have something called responsive desire. And responsive desire means that the sexual desire is responsive and always context specific. So usually within a relationship where somebody is feeling loved and safe, for example, usually already a lot of oxytocin on board. And then usually in a scenario where they're not, um, where they feel safe and where they feel they have the energy and the, um, the, the, the circumstances needed for sexual desire to actually arise. But it does mean that they do not normally experience any spontaneous sexual desire. So if there's not a context for it, they do not experience it. They have little or no sexual fantasies. And if they do fantasize, it's romantic fantasies. It's a bit like those romance movies. It just goes up to the kiss and then they sink behind the, below the horizon. And the kind of media that will enjoy would be much more romantic novels or romantic movies. And actually, they would rarely or never need to masturbate because there's not of this, none of this spontaneous sexual desire. Now, one of our challenges is, is that a lot of people with responsive desire has been told over the years that there is something wrong with them. Um, 
and that there's been a lot of, uh, you know, and if you look at pharmaceutical companies, has been desperately trying to find some drug to induce um, sexual desire. Um, but actually, it just has to do with being able to understand how, how your intimacy works. This does not mean that they don't experience desire. It's only that it experienced in specific scenarios. So let's get a little bit to some of the terminologies. So this is um, the term asexual um, is also much more uh, much more common these days. That's the flag up there. And the definition of that is a person who does not experience sexual attraction to another person. Um, and now that we understand how testosterone, these will be testosterone, they do not have that testosterone pathway. And there is a lot of different, this is sort of an umbrella term, and there's lots of different variations under this. So for example, you get some asexuals that are sex negative, where they actually find the idea of sex unpalatable, sex repulsed, leave the room if there's any sexual scenes on TV. Um, some people are asexual or sex neutral, ah, take it or leave it. My body doesn't respond like that, but I don't particularly uh, mind um, it. But you also get asexuals that are sex positive. They see sex as normal, healthy part of life. They themselves don't experience sexual desire, um, but they are pretty au fait even with having sex. And there's some related identities that also fall under this umbrella, gray sexual. So this is somebody who never or hardly ever experiences sexual interest, but it might happen on rare occasions. Um, and then there's demisexual, which is somebody who only feels sexual attraction once they have a strong emotional connection to somebody. So remember when I spoke about that responsive desire, this would actually, and I've been working with responsive desire um, patients for many, many years. And then only this year discovered the term demisexual and realized, well, hold on, this is actually a description of a very specific experience that we see in, in a lot of women. Um, and one of the things is that one of the things we are doing is re-looking at the research through the years. So there was a study done in the last five or 10 years where they were looking at American women. Um, I think it was over the ages of 30 who were in married stable relationships and they were measuring libido because that's what we do. And they found that 70% of women in those relationships, older women in stable relationships had no, had no libido. So they had no spontaneous sexual fantasies and no spontaneous desire. And then was, this was now classified as hypoactive sexual disorder. Um, but now we can look back at that and go, hold on, maybe quite a big percentage of them is actually demisexual and would experience sexual desire in the, in the correct context. So we are, this is one of those works in progress. And that's the flag for the demisexuals. And it's important to understand that 74% of asexual people may still experience romantic attraction. So this is just talking about the testosterone cycle. So you do also get something that's aromantic and you get some people who are ace arrows. So they're both asexual and aromantic and somebody who's aromantic does not have any romantic attractions to others. So they don't do the mushy oxytocin bonding oh, um, kind of thing. It's not the way their body works and they may or may not have sexual attraction. And again, there's gray romantics. So people who might rarely get romance um, and then there's demi romantic. So somebody has to be really emotionally connected to somebody, really, really good friends with somebody, and then maybe romantic feelings um, will arise. Um, and I did mention earlier that testosterone and oxytocin is not the only hormones. So we also have a scenario where one can use um, hormones like adrenaline that can slightly spice sex up. And very important, this is what we would call the release of, of safe um, adrenaline. And what I mean by that is the difference between going down Butterworth Pass, it's a hair raising pass just outside East London, without your brakes, terrifying, and going down a roller coaster. So going down a roller coaster can be quite fun for some people, not everybody. Um, but if you were going down Butterworth without brakes, that'll be horrifying for everybody. And most sexual play, which brings a little bit of adventure or a little bit of spicing it up, always happens in being able to create safety. So, for example, sexual fantasy, one can have sexual fantasies that might be terrifying if it happened in real life, but because you're controlling it in your own mind um, and you are completely able to decide what and how it's going to happen, that actually creates a um, safety, a bit of excitement, but safety to be able um, to enjoy the, the fun. Um, sexual role play and cosplay fall into that. 
And then I just want to say a word about BDSM. So your bondage, discipline, dominance, submission, you know, all of that, that kind of stuff always makes the eyebrows raise. What's interesting with BDSM in the world of sexual health, we think that BDSM is one of the most mature adult types of sex play out there because of the extraordinary level of informed consent. So for somebody to regularly go um, have be in BDSM or be in BDSM scenarios before they engage, otherwise it's not fun, it has to be safe. So a bit like the roller coaster, before they sit down, they will have a full conversation about exactly what they are expecting, um, exactly what they like, what they don't like, how far things can go, what their thresholds are. Um, and there's rules. Anytime you can pull out during whatever is happening, if you're not comfortable, um, they will have a safe word system. Um, and if we had more of this level of informed consent into normal sort of vanilla style, missionary style sex, uh, sex will probably be much, much, much safer. Um, and there's also kink. And then the only one that's probably dangerous um, is erotic asphyxiation, which is where you actually reduce the oxygen flow and while, while you're orgasming. Um, and apart from that one, which can be dangerous if you're not, not sure what you're doing, everything else is extremely safe. And as a matter of fact, sex is one of the few human things that we have that's actually good for your health. <laughs> and actually very safe. Um, and it's one of those things that can give us a little bit of pleasure without having to feel, feel guilty about it. So just to complete all of our attraction things, they are also aesthetic attractions. So that's just, you know, person you take out on a date to your, um, as your plus one, uh, where it's purely about, about physical appearances and then emotional attraction, which all of us experience in our friendships, in our relationships. And that has to do with, with building an emotional bond with someone. So if somebody is ace arrow, so asexual and aromantic, they might still want to build a very close relationship to somebody on an aesthetic basis or on an emotional basis. Um, and these are often called queer platonic relationships. So they're not romantic in nature. There's no sexual sex involved. There's no hugging or kissing or cuddling involved. But it's got a very close emotional connection, more so than just an ordinary friendship. Great. So there we go. We've just covered a whole lot of diversity. And what I'd like to do now is I'm just going to bring it right into the relationship and look at how does